Welcome to the founders of Web3 series by Outlier Ventures and me, your host, Jamie Burke. Together, we're going to meet the entrepreneurs, their backers, and the leading policymakers that are shaping Web3. Together, we're going to try to define what is Web3, explore its nuances, and understand the mission and purpose that drive its founders. If you enjoy what you hear, please do subscribe, rate, and share your feedback to help us reach as many people as possible with the important mission that is Web3. So today I'm really happy to welcome Muneeb Ali, uh, CEO and co-founder of Blockstack, um, described as uh, software for a user-owned internet. And we're going to kind of unpack exactly what that means shortly. But fundamentally, they've been building a, a modular stack that allows for DAP developers to give users direct ownership of assets and protect user privacy. Muneeb, it's great to have you on the show. Really excited to be here. Um, so uh, there's a couple of reasons why I really wanted you as a founder on the show. Firstly, I think your approach around building this uh, stack, uh, end-to-end stack, I know it's modular, um, and I know you talk about being able to move elements or components in and out, um, but fundamentally you are um, trying to solve for a number of key innovations that any DAP developer needs from identity, smart contracts, and then this execution and, and data storage. Um, and I think this is an emerging trend that we're, we're seeing now well, with other protocols like Near and what have you. And then the second one is that, you know, you're rare in the Web3 space, at least for having taken the, the hard path of both domiciling in the US, working directly with the SEC on how you structured the sale and then increasingly how users can participate in that network. And having been involved in a number of uh, US projects myself, I know just how hard that is. So those two things are what I really want to kind of cover off today. Yep, uh, ha- happy to dive into it. I think I think Netscape is a good example. If you look back at the early days of the traditional internet, uh, if you look at what Netscape was trying to do, they wanted to bring the internet to a lot of users, right? And along the way, whatever technology piece they had to invent because it just didn't exist, they would just go ahead and do it, right? So JavaScript came out of that. Uh, Cookies came out of that. And um, even the client server architecture, it came out of that. But Netscape was, uh, people think of Netscape as like a browser company, but these fundamental technologies had to be invented so that, uh, you know, normal users can access the internet. And, And I think a little bit of, of that is happening now with the next version of the internet or Web3, as uh, some people call it, where there are all these like different technology pieces that are missing. And really, you know, we just have to build it out, right? Because they just don't exist. And uh, if they're kind of like roadblocks, we have to uh, make sure that we get over them so that we can truly enable a user on the internet for the users. And I think that's why our approach ended up being like this uh, full stack and it gives you uh, solutions for all these different uh, problems that developers face. Yeah, and I really like the way, you know, if you listen to podcasts or interviews when you're talking about the vision for Blockstack, you you talk about it almost in a hundred year cycle. In fact, I'm I'm pretty sure at one point you you referred to looking at Blockstack's pathway and potentially even uh, its decentralization on, on that kind of time horizon. And so, you know, really at this stage, you're looking to, to, to allow people almost to easily navigate from, from web to the current paradigm, which is where 99% of developers are into, into this new space in, in baby steps. Is, is that a good descriptor? Yep. I, th- I think that's, that's absolutely right. And um, just to give you an idea of like some of the decisions we internally made, in 2017, when we were uh, doing our first token offering to kind of like uh, build the, the the 1.0 of the Stacks blockchain, uh, we were setting up our treasury and we set the unlocking. So the, the long-term treasury starts to unlock at year four after launch and, and basically unlocks uh, for seven years, right? So that, that these are the kind of like time horizons that we are talking about in terms of... Uh, how long we expected it would take 
for for some of these various te tech pieces to come together or uh, slowly getting more developer traction and user traction. So absolutely, I think this is one of those like ten plus year long journeys where you know that you're you've taken on a very ambitious project and and it's going to take a while. And I think it's great that you've almost self imposed these. Um, milestones into you know the release of capital um which is obviously very typical in how venture capital works in a conventional sense you know you reach a milestone and then you unlock um more capital to kind of um, have this kind of elevator stepped approach um and in many other projects that was just missing you know almost blank checks were written and often without much obligation to deliver anything and then the onus is the moral um, obligation is 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 on the founders, but really from day one, you've tried to make this look as conventional as possible, or at least as understandable as possible to an investor. Yeah, so I think over there, uh, the the key difference that that we noticed was uh, when you're launching a blockchain, the Genesis block, uh, the first block, is really a once in a lifetime type event, right? So you're doing a distribution of these crypto assets to investors or early um, developers and community, but you can only do it once because right. once the network is launched, uh, kind of like it's decentralized and you can't really change these allocations or the, or the supply. Uh, and what that does is that um, unlike traditional venture capital, uh, where you kind of like show progress and then you go out to the market, you know, the VC market and you try to raise more capital, uh, and, and as you unlock the next level, you know, people will back you and give you more capital. This, this is a little bit of a dilemma where uh, you can only really allocate, make these allocations early on. And once the network is live, it becomes very hard to make these allocations. And I think that's why we saw uh, some projects raise, you know, very large amounts of capital with no uh, really like checks and balances on them. And our approach was like trying to find a middle ground that sure, you know, we know that uh, the development of this technology and this network is going to take many years, would require a lot of capital. But at the same time, we wanted to have like some checks and balances so that it helps the team focus as well. And plus, you know, there's this, uh, and these were self-imposed, right? Like back back in 2017, you could pretty much raise capital for anything, right? And we were, uh, we were actually, uh, we were putting an upper limit on how much uh capital can a single entity put into the offering, right? Because th those were just like Wild West type days and and uh, raising too much money could also be, be problematic. And was the, so was that design choice, um, was that a consideration from the lawyers that said, look, if you want to forge this pathway um, around the reggae plus offering, these are sensible things to have in place? Or was it, it was it much more about trying to establish trust in, as you say, a kind of wild west. No, so it wasn't from the lawyers, and it was. Um, so this was the this was done in the 2017 offering. So what we did was we uh, the 20 in the 2017 offering we were really looking at legal frameworks for how to even do this, right? And if you if you remember back then there was a uh, there was this like SAFT like structure that was being used by a lot of projects. And I'm a, I'm a computer scientist, right? I'm not a lawyer. I just like from first principles looked at those frameworks and I just didn't feel comfortable, right? Like there was the sense, there was something in me that was like, hey, this is, this is doesn't, doesn't feel right to me and I, I want to do some more research. And uh, even like, you know, law firms, like I talked to a lot of law firms and I would listen to their arguments, but like I would, I, I was just feeling that I'm not getting the right answers. And we ended up uh, working with someone who, at that time, you know, the Wilson Sonsini wasn't was not very active in uh, crypto offerings. And uh, we worked with this lawyer, um, Rob, uh, Rob Rosenblum, who's like an expert in securities regulations, right? Like he's the he's the guy who got um, AngelList and Naval Ravikant a no action letter for uh, for AngelList, and he's he's worked at the SEC before absolutely domain expert in what he does right but wasn't at that time not now now he knows a lot about crypto but back three years ago uh, wasn't paying that much attention to the the crypto networks and what's happening here but i could sense that that he's extremely deep in the securities regulations 
and, and how the SCC operates. And I basically started forming the, this partnership where I'm kind of like filling him in on, on the unique characteristics of the crypto networks. He's kind of like explaining to me securities regulations, but what, what it made sense to me, right? Like, like it was, it's, it's almost like a, like a math problem in a way, right? Like you figure out what these regulations enable you to do, what are the things that you can't do? And then we came up with a fairly traditional structure uh, where we were setting up these Delaware funds. Like I think a lot of sophisticated investors understand Delaware funds. They're just becoming limited partners in these funds. And uh, the LP agreement is structured in a way that they're basically buying these crypto assets, right? And and we had those milestones kind of like baked into the LP agreement. And, and at that time, like another thing that we did back then was uh, we knew that because of securities regulations in the U.S., uh, we cannot offer our community and developers uh, kind of like participation. And that really bothered us, right? So what we did was uh, we were giving out these like vouchers. They were non-binding, right? Uh, they were non-binding and they were for anyone in our community or anyone kind of like who heard about the offering and was early to come and get the voucher so that they get the same price as the sophisticated investors, right? Uh, and they were, but they had to be non-binding from, for, from a legal perspective. And the offering that we did in 2019, the SEC qualified one, which obviously was a lot of work. A lot of people thought that, you know, we'll never be able to actually get qualification or there's no way that the SEC would ever allow uh, uh, crypto assets to be offered through, through uh, offerings like reggae. Uh, but we were, we were able to figure it out. And uh, interestingly, a big reason for doing that public offering, other than kind of like open opening up the, the U.S. markets to be able to participate was the voucher holders, right? Because we kind of like told them that we will work on a framework and you will be able to get the same price as the sophisticated investors from 2017. And they did. And I'm, I'm, I'm extremely proud of that work that, you know, we, uh, we made sure that our community and our early developers, like they were able to participate in a, in a compliant way, even if they're U.S. citizens. And, uh, and they go, they kind of like were able to participate at uh, at the initial prices as well. Yeah, and I know we'll we'll talk a little bit later. You're you're continuing to try to push the envelope now to have even greater participation by users in all aspects of the network. Um, uh, and again, that you know requires you to uh, probably educate and engage with um, the SEC, and and it's. It's not easy being first. It's costly. It takes time. Um, and as I'm going to hopefully unravel, um, this isn't necessarily somewhere I'd imagine you, you, you would enjoy spending all of your time focused on dealing with, with, with lawyers. Um, so if I can try to summarize your, your background for the listeners. Um, so you were born and raised in, in Pakistan. Um, your life transformed when your father brought you and your brother uh, a computer and that sent you down this path of computer science and, and introduced you into this kind of open internet culture. Um, and the story goes that you traveled to uh, Sweden as a research assistant, uh, I believe without funding, which is perhaps the first sign of uh, entrepreneurial risk taking. Um, and you ended up at Princeton, um, where you secured a PhD in computer science, and your thesis was nominated for uh, the AC, uh, ACM SIGCOM Award. Um, and during that time, you've really specialized in, in distributed systems. And I believe a lot of your research had, had been cited over, um, over a thousand times in various research publications. And ultimately, that all led you to the co-founding of Blockstack in 2013, as I have it. Yep, I think that's a that that's a pretty accurate description. And I would I would, I would if you were to summarize this right, it would be that um, growing up in, in in Pakistan, especially when you know you'd have like a, a single state-controlled television. I think we had two. Uh, one one was state-controlled, the other was semi-state-controlled. And and you you discover the internet and you have a computer. And you're you're growing up in a third world country, and suddenly you're just li your life changes, right? Like you've discovered um, this new world, and it's it's magical, and and you know there's you have access to information, you're connecting with people all over the world, and the internet was really like much more open and decentralized and friendly even uh, back back in the 90s, 
And I think my, my journey was pretty much like trying to look under the hood of how the internet works. Like, how can I program it? How can I uh, change certain aspects of it? And, and it just led me into computer networks and building other different types of internet protocols. In, in terms of my PhD, I think it's like, yes, it's a degree and, and all of that. But the, the motivation there was really like there were certain people um, like who are still alive in, in this world that I just wanted to work with. Right. Like I, I just deeply, deeply admired the work that they've done and I wanted to learn from them. And the PhD was the excuse to basically get to know them and get to uh, actually be able to work with them. And I think we've been very fortunate to actually involve uh, a, a bunch of these folks that I deeply admire uh, in, with Blockstack, with the project. And I think that's where even even the starting of Blockstack is a little bit uh, unconventional because it really was a research project that was funded by VCs, right? Like that typically doesn't really happen. Right. Uh, and, and I think we were pretty upfront about it. Like a lot of um, our early investors, like I think Naval Ravikant, explicitly, I remember this email he wrote uh, because he invested some money himself. This is like pre when we went to Y Combinator. This was right before that, and then he um, had his own syndicate on AngelList. And I think the email he wrote was, "This is a this is a science experiment uh, with a high probability of not going anywhere, uh, <laughs> but I but, but I'm investing anyway." And then the syndicate filled up overnight. I was like, "Naval, were you like trying to?" sell this or it was like no i was just telling the truth <laughs> and so i mean it's interesting I, I kind of when i was doing my research there are a couple of different narratives about the, the formation of blockstack so um i was aware that it was initially kind of this research project an r&d project in a way as you mentioned somewhere in the middle of all that you got accepted into y combinator and as i understand it you you actually I don't know dropped out just before it got accepted or during to go back to Princeton to was it to sit another PhD because you felt that um, the world had moved on so much that you needed needed to refresh it. Yeah, so I think the, uh, this was um, this, uh, this is slightly different. So basically, what happened was I was about to get done with my PhD in 2013. Right. So this is, I started at Princeton in 2008, you know, they have various requirements and that you have to kind of like clear. And I was like pretty much getting, getting ready to finish my thesis. Uh, and that's kind of like the average time a typical PhD student takes there. And I, I just didn't want to work in academia, right? Like I was, I, I made up my mind that I want to go into startups and I want to raise uh, venture capital because the, the entire, you know, working with the National Science Foundation and getting research grants was, was feeling very bureaucratic to me, right? Like I had to write like a hundred page doc for 300 gain funding or something like that. Whereas in Silicon Valley, you know, people will give you more money than that over a cup of coffee, right? Like it's, like, it's just, just like day and night. And um, so I kind of like on purpose took a leave because Finishing my PhD was a backup plan for me, right? If the startup fails, I'll go back and finish my PhD and basically uh, then, then see what I want, want to do. So we, we went through Y Combinator. I met my co-founder at Princeton as well. Uh, at the this Science department. Yeah, Ryan. And we went through Y Combinator. And it, during Y Combinator, we were kind of like building the underlying infrastructure, so Blockstack, and also building the first app on top of it, right? So most people kind of like saw the app first, uh, and this was this was one name, right? So and did you build the infrastructure because the app needed it, or was the app to illustrate the power of the the infrastructure? The, the app was there to illustrate the power, and uh, the infrastructure was the thing that we were building, right? right? And so it's it's basically and 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 more people knew about the app, right? Like so so one name was the more kind of like dominant, prominent uh, brand, and then slowly we introduce Blockstack that, hey, here's the, here's the real thing. This is, this, is the, um, this is the infrastructure over which any developer can do this, right? And now we have over 400 applications uh, built, built on the network. So the PhD thesis part, let me go back and finish that loop. What happened was that we, uh, I was like very surprised by the lack of sophistication at that time, especially, I think things are much better now um, of the kind of like technical works that were coming up in, in the crypto industry, like, like 
sophisticated researchers would laugh at those things, right? Like, like it's like anyone can just like write half-baked ideas on a white paper and people were raising capital on it. And there wasn't a lot of in-depth reviews um, or, or uh, basically even questions being asked that, hey, is this architecture even technically sound? And I think what we did was we were like, well, we have deep roots in distributed systems. So let's just go back uh, to the traditional computer science conferences and try to publish our work there. And which was actually a little bit of a struggle because uh, people didn't really understand blockchains and this and that, but we were able to publish at some of the top conferences. And that enabled me to write a new thesis on Blockstack and submit it. So Princeton was very, uh, very friendly to me in that sense that A, they let me be on leave for a very long time, like just working on Blockstack. B, because I was able to publish that work, they allowed me to write a thesis on it and accepted the thesis. So in some ways, like I, I, I did my thesis twice and they were different. And one of them is Blockstack. The, the, the one that eventually got accepted is Blockstack. And I mean, I imagine that, again, you know, you, you had this um, focus on distributed systems, but really, I mean, you could be working in any number of different technology domains. You could be working in quantum or, or anything else. What was it that gravitated you towards the problem that Blockstack is is solving? So why why that subset of, of 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 problems? Yeah, I think it goes back to why I even left academia, right? Like, I think the core reason is that I I think. For example, like I find computer algorithms fascinating. Like, you know, I can, I can be in a room, you know, just trying to work on like really hard problems. And I enjoy that work. But what I enjoy a lot more than that is when um, technology can have a meaningful impact on the everyday lives of people, right? So going back to like, why did I fall in love with the internet? It's like, I could see how, it changed my life, right? It changed my mental models. It changed how I think. It changed who I became. Like, like imagine, imagine a parallel universe where I did not get a computer when I was 16 or, or I did not have an internet connection. I could still be living in Pakistan somewhere, right? Like maybe interested in some other things. So the, 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 the power of, of changing someone's life through technology uh, like it's it's just fascinating, and I think that's why like quantum computing, like I'm intellectually like super interested in it. Part of me wishes that you know I can lock myself um, in a in a room or a library and just like go deep on these things. But then when I think about um, the internet and think about imagine even the virus crisis, right? Like imagine how critical the internet infrastructure is, like. I think life is a little bit still normal and so many people are able to work because so many things migrated to the internet, right? And you are, you, we are able to have this podcast right now and, and we are not like completely disconnected from each other. So it was, it was that aspect of taking a technology and actually impacting people's day-to-day life with it um, that I think just, just fascinates me more than anything else, more than even uh, more technically complex problems, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I was going to say, you know, I mean, I, I'd, I'd probably describe you as the, the kind of engineer, entrepreneur engineer, there are kind of different founder types if we're going to tr- try to categorize people. Um, and I think one of the challenges um, you typically see when you speak to somebody that is, you know, very engineering led, typically comes out of, of research is, um, certainly their focus on product and on, on the kind of the, the marketing side or the building of a startup. Um, and so how do you, how do you divide things up with your, your, your co-founder or your management team? Um, do you still touch code? You know, what, what's that journey been like for you as um, as a founder, as an entrepreneur? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing that stood out to me was um, it just, the work that needs to be done. So at, like, imagine it's almost like a video game, right? And there are some critical things that you need to do before you unlock the next level of it, 
right? And the only thing that matters is that given the resources that you have right now, the only game that is going on is can you unlock the next level or are you going to die on this level, right? And this is a little bit like how I think about startups. And so given the resources that you have, uh, what is the problem that you're working on? And that problem keeps changing year over year or whatever the time frame is. Uh, and it really depends on what level uh, of the game you're at right now, right? So over, over the, the course of the years, I, uh, it's, it's interesting, like at some point I realized that um, me writing code is not the most efficient thing for Blockstack. And the bottleneck was like, you know, just just people, like really high quality people that should um, be helping us and working on Blockstack. So I, I remember my algorithm for kind of like um, hiring was that who are the smartest people that I've ever worked with? Uh, and can I convince them to come and join, right? So uh, I was very fortunate that these uh, two early uh, scientists, all, they're also from Princeton, Jude Nelson and then Aaron Blankstein, I was able to spend time with them. And I think with Jude, it took me like some like six months, uh, with Aaron, probably like two, three months, just convincing them that this is the best thing that you sh- can be doing with your time. They, they could like, you know, with their talent and their credentials, they could probably go and work anywhere. I think Aaron had an option to go work uh, at some of the core systems at Google. Uh, Jude, you know, he's, uh, his advisor is Larry Peterson, who's considered a god in computer networking. And, and he, could, he could go and work with him and convincing him not to go work with, for Larry and come work at this small startup is like a, is like a big thing. And so, so I remember like when, especially when Aaron came, uh, this is a, there's a record of this on GitHub. I think Aaron joined April of 2017, which was my last commit on public commit on GitHub. And Aaron started then, like it's almost like I've handed something over and I got someone who was like way better at me at what he does. And I started looking at other things. It could be legal, right? It could could be something else. And the job kind of like just keeps changing all the time. And I really think of this in terms of levels and, and, what do you need to do to unlock the next level? Well, I mean, I must say, at least from the outside, uh, I, I look at you know how you've navigated the regulatory environment of the SEC, some of the market, marketing that you've been doing um, with the Can't Be Evil, um, and uh, you know some of the kind of media that you're doing as a CEO, and, and you seem to be uh, excelling in in all areas. So um, it certainly, whatever you've got going, it certainly looks like it, it's working. So, well, thank thank you so much. I can I can share that internally. It feels that you're just failing all the time at multiple, <laughs> at multiple yeah. things. Don't worry, it's it's the same over here. So so coming back to and I guess if we're thinking about how so how do you attract these best in field? You know, clearly it's you and your leadership, but it's also the mission. The mission has to be big enough, juicy enough. Um, and so you described it as the um, software for a user-owned internet. Um, maybe we unpack that a little bit. And why is it internet and not web? Why why make that distinction? Yeah. So I think uh, people kind of like use the term interchangeably. And even we use the term web three because it, ha- it has a meaning now in, in the industry. Um, internet is just a more technically accurate term because we do touch um, the lower layers of the internet stack, right? So we do provide solutions at the, at the DNS layer, right? So naming, naming systems built on blockchains where people can truly own uh, what they're registering, even public key infrastructure. Uh, so we, it's like the, technically the World Wide Web or the web sits on top of the underlying internet plumbing, but the work that we are doing changes the underlying internet plumbing as well, right? That's why uh, we, we, we kind of use that term. But in, in general, like, let me unpack the, the software for a user-owned internet. It's basically, I think, think of this as the internet itself in various ways is public infrastructure. It's a little bit like roads, right? Like um, the public infrastructure Anyone can use them, even criminals, right? Like you can't ban people from using roads. Um, and this infrastructure was getting really old and, and a lot of security loopholes were getting, they were like glaring holes that 
even the founding fathers of the internet, they all agree that these are the current problems with the internet, right? Like even in my entire PhD thesis is actually uh, in some ways, uh, David Clark, the chief protocol architect of the internet, who's a researcher at MIT, like his design influenced the original design of the internet a lot. And over the years, he has come up with new designs for how the internet should have been. And my thesis kind of like extends that, right? So in, in some ways, like you can even think of what BlockSack is doing as implementing the designs of the original chief protocol architect of the internet, right? So it's, 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 like, uh, it's like an upgrade of that 40-year-old public infrastructure. And we are, we are, we have the initial years of the, of the uh, project, we have built out that public infrastructure. But now developers also need developer tools for interacting with the public infrastructure, right? So we, again, like it, it's going back to the Netscape example, that whatever needs to be done, we need to do it, right? Like we, we want to reach the end goal and whatever hurdles there are along the way, we basically need to solve it. So not only that we had to build the public infrastructure, uh, we had to build the developer tools as well to enable developers to easily build uh, applications. And I think a big challenge uh, down the road is how do we make it easier uh, for users like it, like yes, we have like more than 400 applications, but it's still you know relatively hard to use these applications, or people don't get the the true value of it. And and um, I think that's that's the next step in the evolution, where you can clearly separate a Web two app from a Web three app. The underlying plumbing works, right? These things scale; uh, they are secure. Developers understand it. I think we are at the level of um, helping developers understand this, learn about it, and easily use it. That's, that's where we are in terms of evolution. And then the next step is more about uh, like mainstream users. So specifically, I mean, there's many things that you communicate about the problem that Blockstack's solving for that certainly I subscribe to, and I'm sure anybody that would associate themselves to the mission around Web3. Um, at its heart, it's this idea that you know, the internet is, is, is broken, as, as you alluded to. It needs to be upgraded. It's a, a bit of a black box. Um, and I know you've, you've uh, um, stated that currently Google and Facebook is the internet. Um, and the internet is not free, um, uh, presumably because you subscribe to the idea that there's this implicit, um, you know, payment with data, um, which led to this, what I believe is a, a genius marketing campaign around um, uh, can't do evil versus uh, Google's don't do evil, which they, they obviously dropped a few years back anyway. Um, so uh, am I right to describe this as the, the mission is kind of this unbundling of the internet as, as it is today? Yeah, so I think the um, that's that's the high level problem that basically what happened was, I think the, the internet of the 90s that I just have very fond memories of did not have these large companies that everyone is kind of like connecting to and they're spying on you and they know everything that, that you're doing, right? And Web 2.0, which felt like an upgrade at the beginning is really the problem that we are trying to solve, right? What, what happened with Web 2.0 is that you started, um, the like th think of this as um, Web 1.0 was like desktops, right? That were, and it was more peer to peer. Like everyone had their own website. Like uh, you would go on IRC to chat with each other. You're not going through a company. Like right now you are uh, like everything you do on the internet and, and people don't even realize these things at times uh, that, you know, every website you visit or at least 60, 70% of them are reporting data back to Google about wherever you are or what you're doing. And they, they've now started um, feeling this, that, hey, I was at my home talking to my wife about some product and then I started seeing ads for it, right? Because now it's, it's creeping into voice as well. It's creeping into your location. And what the problem that people face, like they they can sense it. Um, it shows up in different examples all the time. Like just yesterday, I think Kevin Rose um, was, was one of the investors and uh, he, he was talking about how Grammarly, which is a perfectly fine product, right? It helps you write better sentences and does spell checking and better grammar. Basically, literally stores every single keystroke that you have, right? And it's, it's like 
scary to think about that, that this company has every single thing that you have typed in your emails and browsers and whatnot. But then so many other companies have uh, are doing that kind of data collection as well. And it is no longer your personal software on your personal machine uh, that is private and, and you're using it. And, and then a step further is uh, we're moving into a world of digital assets, right? Like there are internet assets now that you can directly own. And I think it's extremely important to get this right because you don't want to be in a position where only companies own assets and people don't have uh, kind of like direct ownership of, of these assets because they will, they, will, uh, they will be left out of the internet economy that way. You wouldn't have a true internet economy where anyone can freely participate if you keep on going down the, the current path of large tech monopolies. And, and I think even governments are realizing that, right? So there's a lot of talk about antitrust or, or regulation against these companies. I think regulations end up harming, uh, doing more harm than anything else, right? These are problems that can be solved at, at the technology layer at, at, by enabling more competition, by enabling certain uh, models where it's it's much harder to build the monopolies like the ones that exist today. Yeah, so I mean, it's really interesting that you talked about some of the founding fathers of the internet and, and the web r- reflecting upon design choices that they made, um, how they may may or may or may not have been right, and what upgrades are possible. Um, you know, I always think about the the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace and some of the things that are contained in that, which were you know, very clearly political choices. One was specifically that um, you wouldn't have identity and the other one was that you wouldn't have property. Um, both of these constructs seen as um, tools of the state. Um, and you could argue because there is no universal protocol for identity, this is why we have many of the intermediaries on the internet as it stands today. From your perspective, how do you, it is the dogma that you see being carried uh, forward into Web3 and, you know, what are the things that you think are fundamentally missing, or fundamentally broken that, that need to be solved from an engineering perspective? Yeah, so I think it's, in many ways, Web, Web3, if you simplify it, is doing two things, right? Uh, one is it's introducing some new functionality that just didn't exist in Web2. And th- that functionality is mostly around um, ownership of assets and smart contracts. Those are the really two things. And even they are linked, right? You usually own the, the assets through smart contracts. And the other category is all about alternatives to things that already exist in Web2, but you flip the client server model and you make the clients more powerful and you depend less on the servers, which is a, which is a huge change from a technical architecture perspective, right? The, a lot of plumbing needs to happen for that to, to take place. But for a user, it's basically, uh, it could be a very trivial change as well, right? Like for example, um, if you are, if you're doing taxes in a web three private app, like it, you're just, all of your information is just with you and it's mostly running on your device versus you know, you're giving all that data to a company and you're using a server that a company is running, right? So that's, that's kind of like, it's like undoing the negative things um, in, in empowering the users plus introducing these new functionality that just didn't exist. And I think that's where most of the innovation is going to happen and that's where a lot of excitement is going, where a lot of excitement is going to be. Uh, because of because of these new features, you mentioned the the, the founding fathers of the internet and their uh, their thoughts about this. There, I think there there was this event in 2016, I believe, it's called the uh, decentralized web summit. It was held at the Internet Archive uh, head office, which is like in this yes. beautiful church building. And I think it will be one of the historic events. Uh, it, web, the biggest uh, threat to Web three is actually mass adoption. I think the technology layer, we'll figure it out. Like we are almost there, uh, different projects. And especially in the last two years, I think a lot of sophisticated uh, teams have entered the space as well. And I'm very confident that, you know, Blockstack has figured out a lot of this. 
other projects are making a bunch of progress. The, the biggest challenge is going to be mass adoption. And we can, we can get into that, but let's assume that, you know, it's five years from now, 10 years from now, Web3 has massively taken off. This is where, uh, where all the intra-traffic is. And, you know, it's like a trillion dollar economy or so on. I think a lot of the beginning would, would go back to this event in 2016. And um, Sir Tim Berners-Lee was there, um, you know, inventor of the World Wide Web. Windsurf was there, the inventor of TCP/IP. Um, you know, and and it was it was an event where some of these early projects, early crypto projects or Web three projects, all of the founders were kind of there, and they were there are I think uh, pictures of people interacting, and it really felt like one generation of elders, kind of like passing the torch to the next generation. And I think Sir Tim Berners-Lee at that event registered his ID on Blockstack. And that was like such a big event in our community that, you know, the, the, the father of the World Wide Web has officially signed up on, on a Web3 platform and whatnot. And how do you, I mean, obviously, um, I think Tim Berners-Lee's openly um, talked about this idea that the web's broken or it's been hijacked in some way. And he, he's... Uh, having an attempt to fix that through um, through pods. Uh, I forget the name of the project, it's escaped me, but um, this idea of data pods. Obviously that is, and it, there isn't a blockchain and there isn't any tokenization. Um, and I think many people respectfully have said it's a, it's, it's very, it's a very typical uh, response, a kind of a generational gap or gulf between how Tim Berners-Lee would try to solve for these problems compared to people coming through Web3. Why do you think um, approaches like Blockstack is going to uh, make Web3 irresistible? And do you think that um, do you think that people care enough about privacy? I know they should, but do you think they actually care enough about privacy over convenience to 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 um, I guess bear with the inconveniences, the current inconveniences of using it. Yeah. So I think uh, let me let me answer the block stack question. So with block stack, I think there are two th- things that are very different. And one is that I think at a high level, we know that um, there's enough enough data that Web three will be built on top of blockchains, right? I think. Technically, you can have an approach where there isn't a blockchain. There are some solutions, as you mentioned, uh, Tim Berners-Lee is working on one. Keybase comes to mind, right? Like they, they don't really use a blockchain and, 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 and provide some sort of a similar identity features and verification and apps even that, that, that can be built. But I'm pretty much in the camp, and I think a, a lot of other people as well are, that Web3 is going to emerge on top of blockchains. It is still unclear which blockchain, right? And that's why you see almost like even competition, which is a healthy thing. People are trying different experiments. And I think where Blockstack stands out in that landscape is that we are actually innovating around the Bitcoin ecosystem, right? We truly believe that Bitcoin is by far the most secure network, the most stable one. And by design, uh, needs to have a limited scripting language and it needs to have this property that it doesn't change, right? So in many ways, we are adding the functionality needed for Web3 and smart contracts in our blockchain, the, the, the Stacks 2.0 blockchain, and anchoring back to Bitcoin. But the thesis is that Web3 is going to emerge anchored to Bitcoin versus some other smart blockchain. So that's that's one part uh, of Blockstack. The second is a, is a, is a more technical distinction and this is, I think the analogy sometimes I give is, it's the difference between a mainframe-like approach or a desktop, uh, a network of desktop computers type approach, right? So in some ways, like Blockstack's technical architecture is the inverse of Ethereum, right? Like Ethereum and other blockchains that are really trying to do a lot of things at the blockchain layer, uh, they're kind of like mainframes, right? They can only do a single transaction at a time. Uh, they really want to make that mainframe very powerful and do a lot of computations and storage at that mainframe. Uh, Blockstack is the inverse of that, like a very minimal uh, network that mostly does coordination, but most of the the storage and computations, they actually happen with the clients. 
right? So it's, it's a little bit like lots of desktops that are interconnecting with each other and coordinating with each other. So that's, that's where we play in the design landscape. Uh, the, the question of like, you know, would people care about, uh, about this? I think it's, it's more, I think of this as if Web3 is done right, it actually should be more convenient. And privacy is just like a nice to have feature that might, a, a subset of people might care a lot about, but that generally people are not going to care about. But I think it's going to be these new types of features that just couldn't exist in Web 2.0. And people will come for those things, the new things that, um, like, imagine, like, you know, if um, if you, as a user, can actually make more money on a Web3 app than a Web2 app, there's a very strong financial incentive for you to be on a Web3 app, right? The, the privacy and user ownership and all those things, they come as a side effect of it. But your primary motivation might be that, hey, I, I want to I wanna do this because I can be a better part of the internet economy. A little bit like how, you know, companies like Airbnb or Uber enabled users to basically make more money from assets that they already own. And is this from, so that kind of financial motive, is that because there are cost savings on transactional fees by removing middlemen? Or is it because there's this incentive layer which directly rewards participation in in networks and kind of by contributing resources or bootstrapping it in its early days? Yeah, I think it's a combination of, of a few things, but the end result is that imagine uh, some of the most successful companies on the internet right now, right? Like look at Twitter, uh, look at YouTube, look at, you know, Medium is not at that level, but look at Medium as a blogging platform. All of these things, they're effectively user-generated content. Users are doing it. In, in case of YouTube, yes, users get a slice of the pie and they make some money as well. But not on Twitter, not, not, not in other places. And basically what's happening is that the company, and not just the company, but all these ad networks. So there's some optimization that these ad networks are fairly complicated and they can be removed and simplified and there could be a direct relationship between, you know, someone who wants to pay you for your attention and your attention. And, and, and the other side of it is that if it's your content and other people are making money on it, then why aren't you making money on it? Right. So it's like, it, I think what we see on the internet right now, like, a lot of people basically have this reaction that the world is not going to change from this model, whereas the world is always changing all the time, right? And it's it's just a it's just like you know the future is already here; it's just not widely distributed yet. Like it is uh, in my mind, like a couple of years from now, uh, as soon as you know, people would be like people. You should be getting paid for watching any ad on the on the internet. Right, like it's your attention, and that's what advertisers are paying for, and and you can remove all these middlemen. Same for content, right? Like you are, if your content is gaining a lot of, um, kind of like attention on the internet, you should be directly monetizing that. And right now, you know, we are in this like strange place where other companies uh, kind of like benefit from the user without really giving anything back to the users. Forget about giving anything back. They uh, they track you. They Kind of like resell your data in all sorts of strange, creepy ways. And it's just a very broken system uh, right now. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, you were the first kind of reggae plus offering um, around a crypto asset. I think you raised uh, over $23 million. Um, and that took you um, at least a year and, and probably several million um, in, in legal fees. And having forged that path where you've certainly shortened the, the the time horizon and the amount of capital with setting a precedent for other projects to follow. So I think, you know, the industry owes you uh, uh, certainly a debt there. Now you're focused on um, looking at how you can include, uh, I don't know what you would call them, retail users more actively in the network, I think you're going to, is that shifting away from app mining um, or, or is this a kind of an evolution of it? Yeah. So I think um, app, app mining is separate. Let me um, answer that first. So app mining uh, pilot that we ran for over a year 
it was basically kind of like an incentive mechanism to get developers to come and try out our tools and build applications and basically uh, in some ways like prove out that you know web3 apps can exist and can scale to two millions of users and we were very fascinated uh, by this idea of can we automate uh, certain metrics around quality of applications right so we, we tried you know uh, even getting reviews for UX of an app or uh, checking, you know, how decentralized an app is or how actively it's being used. And the interesting thing is that, yes, you can make progress towards these things, but a fully automated algorithm is very hard, right? It's basically whatever metrics you throw at people, especially if there's money involved, right? So there's a there's a distribution of the stacks cryptocurrency that can go to these developers if they are doing well on these metrics. So they rank higher on the uh, kind of like the app mining score and any metric you would throw at people, instead of improving their app, they might actually start gaming the metric itself. Right? So our big, really big takeaway was uh, that we might require humans in the loop. Right? So a little bit more like, uh, you know, it's very hard to automate a Y Combinator, like, you know, Y Combinator, manually goes through a lot of startups and tries to uh, curate the ones that, that can be really good and helps them to uh, build their apps. So I think App Mining 2.0, there are various proposals around, but I will be surprised if uh, a fully automated approach kind of like comes back. But in general, I'm, I'm very much supportive of supporting developers and giving them incentives in your, in your ecosystem to, to basically come and build applications and build, build infrastructure. So that's, that's like where App Mining is right now but in general the work that we're doing is we're in this like a little bit of a strange situation where the the stacks cryptocurrency it's a it's a utility token clearly gets used in applications and users can register assets with it they can use it in applications and so gets consumed as a fuel for smart contracts fairly similar to ether in a way but just because of our kind of like legal framework it is currently uh, not tradable or easily accessible in the U.S., right? So outside of the U.S. Because it's treated as a security in the U.S. It's treated as a security. But outside of the U.S., you know, we got opinions from several jurisdictions. And even in our SEC offerings, we disclose them as non-security jurisdictions where it's treated as a normal utility token. And that's why it trades internationally already, right? So we are doing a bunch of work to figure out how can the U.S. markets also open up for our users and even even potentially for trading. And I think that's something where we have this approach of like an increased path to decentralization because the, the U.S. Uh, securities regulations and the SEC, they use a different framework for looking at what can and cannot be a security. And we are basically trying to, to and no one, again, no one has ever done this before either, right? That, uh, yes, projects have been fined and, you know, they, uh, they've had SEC enforcements against them, but no one has done this in a, uh, in a friendly, compliant manner that here's how you uh, can start off looking like a security in the U.S. And, and then even in the U.S., you're clearly not a security. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I really, um, I mean, I'm not a, a direct uh, in, investor in Blockstack, but I, I really wish you success with the project because I think that, in, in the one hand, just by virtue of when you were bringing the project to market and the pathway that you've chosen, which is ultimately to to work with the regulator to deliver utility, uh, it, in an extent, you've kind of got one, one arm tied behind your back in delivering that utility, which is the, the great irony where something like Ethereum is out there in the wild um, and you know, clearly being treated as a, as a utility, even though there could be you know, very little difference to how that was rolled out versus uh, several other protocols. And, you know, if the aspiration of uh, a given regulator is to increase the utility of a network, then clearly that's about allowing uh, participation and distributing the wealth, value and control of that network. Um, so I really hope that you, uh, you, you can help the SEC um, I, I believe, come to a, a, a more open and kind of innovation first approach. Um, Manib, it's, it's great to have you on the show. Really looking forward to watch the progress of, of Blockstack and your journey as an entrepreneur. And, and hopefully we'll get you on again soon.
Absolutely. It was, it was great to be here. And one comment about the, uh, the SEC is that I think like some projects got grandfathered in like, like Ethereum, but, but it's very hard to tell that, you know, would you end up in a case like Telegram where the enforcement was really bad for the project yes. or it would be something like EOS where, you know, they kind of got away with it. And the approach that we are taking is that, you know, we're, we're not going to take that risk and just make sure that we are, we are, we're in the clear and are complying with, uh, with the applicable law. But this was great, uh, really great talking to you and thanks for all of your support uh, over the years. Great, thanks Manip. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please make sure you subscribe, rate and share your feedback to help us reach as many people as possible with the important mission of Web3.